This episode is brought to you by BigMooseCoffeeCompany.co. Now then, pal, how are we doing? Pal face. Oh, was that loud? Sorry. My, uh... <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit. Don't don't give me an editing challenge straight away. Uh, You've only just walked into the podcast. I leant forward as I answered that. I didn't know we started recording. Sorry. But dude, your hair just gets longer every time. Like, well, that's what happens with hair, doesn't it? Over time, it gets longer. I wouldn't know. Mm. I wouldn't know, Chris. It, it's been an awfully long time since I've had to consider that myself. But, uh, you know, from looking at you, I'd say, yeah, scientifically, hair gets longer over time. Mine, mine does get longer quicker, I've noticed, and my the guy that cuts my hair has said that my hair grows like moss, which... <laughs> Is that a good quality in hair? Is that something you were thicker, looking for? It grows thicker and retains water. I wash my hair. My hair's wet now. I washed it a year ago. It's still, like, wet. That's, that's it's not dried yet that's just the way it is are you telling um, us the last time you washed your hair was a year ago <laughs> i'm not letting you move on <laughs> the um i have a question for you actually while oh, we're God. talking about hair and lack of yeah. um uh, okay i'm just gonna come out with it <laughs> when you wash your face <laughs> when, when do you know where to how how high up do you wash your face i <laughs> That is such a, you know what, people ask that kind of question as a joke, but I get where you're coming from. I don't know. I just do. I guess once it starts sloping back, I'm done. I think that's my judge. So you don't wash your head along with your face. It's just you wash your face up to where there's a... a Imagine that. I'm only, it, I'm only thinking this now because obviously with longer hair comes a responsibility to look after your longer hair. So I've Indeed. never had to pay attention to washing my hair stroke face as much. Um so yeah, it just came into my kind of thought pattern as I was kind of brushing my teeth and getting ready for bed the other day because obviously we've got you and Andy who don't have have hair and it's a it's a, it's a great thing. But I was just wondering, like, it's a great it's, thing. Don't don't, don't try and reel it. I don't back want, now no, make a I don't want to. I don't want to seem like it's a negative thing. It's a great thing. Be old. It's just there's obviously certain things that I've never had to consider until I've I've changed my hair. Well, then there you go. I, I don't think it's a conscious decision where the, there's like a line that I draw where I stop washing. But yeah, you, I don't I don't clean my head. And now you've made me feel like that's weird. Like each time I wash my face in the morning. <laughs> well, now my head's exposed as well. Should I have been cleaning that as well? <laughs> do, you, do you go backwards to the back of your neck? Where because do you like stop? The, yeah. <laughs> you just stop when I hit clothes. <laughs> anyway... Well, this has blown my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm knocking forty, Chris, and I'm going to have to change my entire hygiene routine now. I don't, I don't know how to feel. Also, I the, what's that, what's the, what's that thing that they have when they can't solve the time travel continuum? Is it the grandfather paradox? This is like that. Uh, the grandfather <laughs> paradox is like if you go back in time and kill your own granddad, can you? Because will yeah, you? Yeah, because then you, you wouldn't be around. Yeah, this is the thing, you know, if you've washed how, you know, if you continue to wash your face so it goes round your head to the back of your neck till you hit clothes, what have you now washed? <laughs> and it, <laughs> is that now all face? <laughs> is yeah. that what it is? Do I now just have a large blank area of face on the back of my head? Is that what we have to consider it now? <laughs> I'm lost. This is not uh, what I expected to happen when I hit record, Chris. It's not where I thought we'd be. Hit but your answers you in the uh, comments, folks. Yeah, I mean, if anyone's got any input on this, we would love to hear from you. <laughs> is the back of the head my face? Is it disgusting that I don't wash my head when I wash my face if I haven't got any hair? Genuine question. I don't know. Maybe one of the medics that's been involved in our races can come back with a scientific answer on that. I'd love, love to hear from you. <laughs> oh, I don't know, but I am crying a bit. It's been a long few months, hasn't it, mate? Yeah, whether this gets into the podcast or not, I don't know. But If you think I'm editing this out, you are absolutely mistaken. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> shall, we, shall we start talking about things that matter? Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I absolutely suppose we should. Yeah, all right, what are we talking about again? Well, I, you know, you said you wanted to talk about something serious, but I was about to leap in and <laughs> taking the piss out of you again, because from the pictures that I've seen, um, you, you appear to be living in some kind of warehouse or distribution center at the moment. Would, would, would that be fair to say? That's, and that's and how's that going house. down with Claire? Yeah, that's my house. Um, we have now um, 
we had a few delays in the store. So we've kind of kept quiet about it, but we've been kind of hustling on a, a, a store at the same time. Because obviously our, our guys, we know a fair bit about kit and we've always been kind of reserved, haven't we, to tell people what kit to buy. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we don't want any kind of brand associations and all that kind of jazz. We've not got any like close naming partners on any of our races. So we've been pretty cautious on what to do. And then I kind of got to a point where it's actually, you now there's some real cut and clear products above and we get asked to help develop products a lot. So over the years, we've kind of been stockpiling this and re- waiting for the release until now. And so, yeah, we've got the store, which is launching and just launched, really. We've just had our final few items turn up. But because of old uh, Rona and, and Leeds being in a lockdown, I've had to have everything delivered here. So we've had, in the last week or so, we've had three pallets of gear turn up. So there's close to... 150 hard shell jackets, 150 rain jackets. There's books, technical t-shirts. And now my corridor in my house is just floor to ceiling of boxes to the point now where my pregnant missus has to crab walk through because her belly is, is out here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, my, my life has been uh, quite hard the last week because she's been basically saying when are you going to send out all of this shit that's in my house yeah well i, um, I guess we're gonna to have to sell some of it I, I, the alternative <laughs> seems to be you know I'll claire on her hands and knees having to crawl around this stuff or perhaps just <laughs> using it to build herself a fort <laughs> well no i think i think it's it coincides with the fact that the baby is due within the next you know any time from now for the next four weeks so there's baby stuff everywhere and we're moving house um in case enough. you didn't have enough going on in your life. So there's there's just stuff everywhere. But yeah, it's good though. So I, I mean, I've got a couple of, uh, for people that are listening in and not watching, this might be a little bit of a thing, but there's a couple of tech tees here. So we've got our brand new Montane tech tee with the uh, Montane and, and BTU logos on. It's going to be a pretty much rubbish show and tell really, but just so you can get an idea. <laughs> They're like a little um, workhorse of our kit list really. So they're good for training, good for any kind of environment. And what we've tried to do with the store is get like hearty kit that once you buy it, lasts you a very long time. Um, yeah. We want to be eco-conscious with everything. So uh, there's no tat basically. So anything on the store is going to be... Oh, just one second. No worries. Dog alert. Yeah, um, she's probably lost in the mountain box fort in our <laughs> corridor, buried under the buried <laughs> under the waterproofs. Uh, so yeah, we've got the we've got the tech tees that have, were the last kind of thing to arrive. So they're going to go out, but it's basically all of our favourite kit that we like, and there's going to be more to come. So the idea would be that if you're doing one of our races, you can go out and get your own kit, and and it's all per, kits are very personalised thing. But however, there's some particular items that we would say, you know, stamp of approval. This is a very good item. I think the two really that showcases it are a hard shell and ultralight that have just come out. So, uh, sorry for those guys after some information, I am going to plug this quickly. Um, the <laughs> hard shell is our main, it's our big jacket. So it's our big winter jacket. It's a crystallized down jacket, which is one of the only waterproof down jackets in the world. So it does come at a bit of a cost because the production is really high on it. However, it's one of those jackets that you can wear in minus 40 in the Arctic and has been tried. It's what our team wear when razzing around on snow bikes and stuff, which is like minus 40 plus crosswinds. But you can also wear it down the pub because they look pretty good. Uh, <laughs> you know, any, any time I've worn mine, people have said, oh, where'd you get that from? I'd get one, which has eventually led us to this situation. So because we've developed that product with, with Yeti Nordisk, it's, uh, you know, we, we know that product inside out. We've been involved with its entire development. And the same with the ultralight. So there are really light waterproof jackets. So, the hard shells retail at 310 quid, but the ultralights retail at around 140 and they're a uh, go-to kind of waterproof running jacket that's super lightweight. Uh, they weigh nothing. Like, it's like yeah. somebody just described a jacket to you. You can't feel it in your hand. <laughs> yeah, and we, we I, I put the whole team in it when we were designing a race up in blank. Can't say that yet. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to drop it then. <laughs> but it, it, it was raining pretty much constantly and they absolutely excelled and the good thing about rain jackets is i hate swishy ones <laughs> you know when you run and they go whoosh, 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 like that this is like a 2.5 mid layer a thin layer of like a really stretchable material so it moves and fits around you uh and it, it just works insanely well so either one of those jackets if you was to um 
by it's an investment of of money but what i would say is those things are going to last you ages and they'll do the job for multiple purposes that ultralight will work in our jungle as well as uh you know even an evening in the desert as a as a warmer layer rather it doesn't have to obviously it's not going to rain in the desert but you could also wear it there you could our ice ultra winners have worn that jacket so female oh, yeah, and male, we've had about three or four winners wear that jacket um and then you know in winter in the uk and stuff they'll they'll they've been tested there as well and they work absolutely amazingly so there's a couple of items on the store go check it out it's store.beyondtheultimate.co.uk um there isn't many items on there now there's there's probably close to about 10 items we've even got old our mate shane benzie's book we've got 30 or 40 editions of that name drop for benzie there yeah name drop for benzie so um there's that and there's buffs and the other little bit there and, and if you one of our runners you can top up your merch there as well um yeah that's the store amazing you're an online retailer now mate yeah, that's it. And, and, you know, if anything else, you get some amazing gear that will be useful for your racers and I won't be murdered um, <laughs> by my partner. So if I do disappear in awful circumstances or very suspicious circumstances, it's definitely, definitely Claire Gill. Definitely. A yeah. hundred percent. It's Claire as a Gill. consequence of her having to crawl around on her hands and knees, heavily pregnant as she is for the last few weeks. She's finally yeah. done you in. Yeah. Choked you to shit. death with your hair. When the, when a box arrived this morning, which was, packaging for those so a box turned up full of boxes a box of boxes yeah yeah um that i feel the look was like this leaves my house now (laughs) (laughs) so so we we need to sell some shit basically it's it's in order for you to not be killed yeah so um get your winter gear with us and uh, I won't die. Double win. So what are we actually here to talk about uh, in terms of proactive information for our for our listeners? Well, here we go. We're on to another coaching style episode, aren't we? And if there's one mm. question that we get over and over again, or, 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 you know, an area where we get questions over and over again, it's packing. You know, we, we, we're talking about multi-stage races most of the time and you are having to carry enough stuff to get you through five full days in some outrageous environment <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I can see how it would be daunting to figure out exactly what you are and aren't going to pack and how to do it efficiently. So that's where we are today. That's that's what we've struck upon. Okay, that sound yeah, reasonable. I think, yeah, I think outside of our races, fast packing, as they call it, is becoming a big oh, thing. Yeah, that, that is know, a term I keep hearing a lot. And especially because races have been cancelled this year, people are getting a backpack on with some gear on and just going out into the hills. Yeah, um, which is great. You know, that, I think that is my favorite thing to do. And that's why I love multi-day running because outside of racing on multi-days, there's nothing better in my opinion than picking two points on a map and going from point to point or a big loop or whatever it is and being self-sufficient in that time. It, yeah. it, there's, you know, camping out, sourcing your own water. There's some really cool stuff. And it's, you know, there's, there's companies that are recognizing that people want to do this and even more cool things to do. But it's actually, it's a very individual skill isn't it so there's a load of tips and tricks that unless you take someone for a beer that's done it loads or you're on a race visually learning which is obviously sometimes a bit too late um that you know you need to know ideally and no one you think oh it's just sticking stuff in a bag but there's actually a lot of variables within that isn't there that can massively change your, your performance Absolutely. Uh, you go from one extreme to the other. You've The number of runners that we've seen over the years, mate, and you get some people who their backpack looks like they're stowing at least two other runners in it. It's so big and so heavy <laughs> and bulky. Yeah. You, you get other guys where you cannot believe they've managed to get all of their mandatory kit down to that weight, but you pick it yeah. apart and it's all there. It's just very efficient. Yeah, and it should take a lot of kind of time and attention from someone that's new to it. For people that have done this for a while, you know, and done a few, it becomes a bit regimented, doesn't it? And um, I think for someone that's new to these things, I think it's spending time and effort in researching this. So hopefully this episode will be that thing for you and we'll give you loads of loads of bits. So I think one of the one of the, the things that probably worth talking about first is the the overall capacity and fit of that bag. Um, it's such a big thing, right? Because you get to a start line and you can see that some people, like you say, are carrying a big backpack where some people look like they've got a bag on. It's almost like they're a turtle with their shell. You know, it's part of them, isn't it? It's like it's fitted well, it's packed well, it's just there on their back. There's no movement and things like that where there's some people that look like they've just shoved everything in last minute. It's all messed up and there's just loads of it. So the, the thing to mention is obviously that if you're 
running a long way or walking a long way with a backpack, there's obvious things that you need to consider with a bag, not just the capacity is important and you want to be skirting the line of, uh, you know, that capacity. And we, we can go through some tricks to get more into a, a smaller capacity. Cause I think that's one thing, isn't it? People think, Oh, I'll never get all that stuff into a 25 liter bag. Yeah, you can. Yeah. 25 liter is a big bag. You know, most, most adventures can, you can get things into a 20 and even like five liters or 10 liter bags. You can do once you get good at it for our races, I'd say no less than 20 liters. Yeah. Um, but you shouldn't really be tipping into the above 25. So, um, in terms of a bag fit, what you ideally want is like no movement. It always like, it's one of those things where, um, and this is where particularly with women, I think it's important because, the there i don't think any brand has got it bang on yet for because there's so many different body types for women isn't there really like for guys yeah. it tends to be like your trunk and your torso you've got like v-shaped guys or you've got straight line guys and shoulder width and length vary but it's not that big you know so but with women you've got like bust and hip and waist ratio it's a bigger thing so what i'd say with any woman that is looking at doing fast packing is try the bag on order it and, and, and look at their returns policy and, and get, especially if you're a smaller woman, I think I see, I read and see a lot and we get questioned a lot of like smaller women that are finding it really hard to get into to backpacks. And I think it, um, there are a few that are starting to go down now in like ultimate direction. I think it's starting to address that and it'll catch up. Um, but ultimately for a fit of a bag, you need to make sure that it, it, it hugs your body and there's no movement either laterally or I don't know what that word would be like. Uh, so laterally would be side to side. You don't want it swinging side to side and, and, and moving and you don't want it in and out. I don't know what that movement would be from your back, you know, like basically okay, bump yeah. it, bumping. So yeah, what, 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 you're ultimately, what you're ultimately trying to do is avoid friction because friction points really sit at your shoulders where the weight drags the shoulder into your shoulders and the bottom of your back are the obvious places. And what yeah. you're trying to avoid is either and the slightest movement side to side or bumping like that when you've been doing it for six to 12 hours a day can, can create a bit of asshole, can't it? And oh, especially if you're idea. sweaty and stuff. In some of the environments we're in, they're going to end up getting mud and all sorts of crap under there too. So yeah, that any movement builds up a lot of friction real fast. Yeah, and I think... Um, yeah, I'm quite fortunate that I've not really suffered with this. This is the only thing I've seen Kimball suffer with ever is he had a bit of back rash where the bag was hitting and then he addressed it and stuff. So <clears throat> make sure the bag fits you well. It's tight. It's into your bag, uh, your back, sorry, and there's no movement. And one of the things that can um, prevent that movement as well as the way that you pack your bag. So the, the order in which stuff goes in, we'll talk about that in a second, but um, I think play around with the adjustments. A lot of these bags, you know, you've got adjusters here and adjusters at the side and the clips and things. You need to find out the best one for your body type. <clears throat> and then when you do, you want it tight enough so it doesn't move and it's part of you, um, but not tight enough, obviously, to restrict any of your movement and kind of double you up and double you over. I think that's probably the thing. It's hard to advise on that until you physically, it's, I suppose it's like trying to fit for a bra, right? You never know you a woman knows a bra size until a bra's on and they get it. It's the same with the backpack in this regard because they're, it's, they're unusual sizings. They do small, medium, and large for what could be over 15 or 20 different body types. So, And it's something you're not likely to be used to. So if it, coming to this for the first time, you think, well, a backpack's a backpack. What I need to be worried about is how much stuff it can hold. But mm. actually, you're going to need to try a few different ones while you're in training to figure out what fits you right. And yeah. even then you might you might have a pack and think well this doesn't fit me right at all have a look around do some research there's there's always a number of different ways to fit to adjust that pack and what i found is that there was i'm not going to name the brand because i don't want to look like i'm favoring one over another but i had a pack for a while that i was ready to send back until somebody else came up to me and went well just pull these bits here pull that lift that up a bit and you'll be fine and it was mm. like a different bag you know, it, it, that, yeah. do the work. You'll find a way of doing it that minimizes how much that pack moves around and how well it fits against you. And it's yeah. worth doing. And I think when you're looking at sizes, you want it to fit higher up your back. 
So a lot of people think that like a school bag, it needs to sit on your lower back. Uh, for me personally, like my bag would never come down past the midpoint. It's like actually quite high up. So if I have my backpack on my 20 liter and it's full, so I have the ultimate direction 20 and 25. So it's got like a rollable top. So if that rollable top is fully extended, so the bag's a little longer, I can't wear a backwards cap because the peak hits it. Um, so I, but I know I've got it high enough because it's here, like on the back of my head. Now it's harder when the bag gets emptier because it hits on your shoulders, but I can also put my hands like into the middle of my back and hands behind my back and hold the bottom of the bag. It's not anywhere near my arse. Like it's, it's up there. It's high. And the reason for that is it just helps with the distribution of weight your body is upright, it's holding it there and it's not dragging you back. So in terms of packing your bag, that's another very important point because what a lot of people do is they go, right, here's my common sense. I'm going to think, well, what I need for the today, I need to put at the top of my bag or what I'm going to get out first when I finish, like my sleeping system or my sleeping bag, I need at the top of my bag. And all of the food for the next few days needs to go at the bottom which is logical, isn't it? You think all the stuff I don't need is at the bottom, but what happens then is all the heavy stuff is at the bottom and all yeah. the light stuff is at the top. So your sleeping bag's at the top and all your heavy stuff's at the bottom. So when you're looking at that kind of bounce of a bag, all of your heavy stuff is there and it's creating sway. My argument is put your light packet on weight of kit. So put your light stuff at the bottom and, and filter in some heavier stuff. So pack it that way so you've got an equal distribution of weight with your heavier things being at the top and center of your back. So if your heaviest item is your wet hammock for the jungle or your heaviest item is four days of food that you've got in a sack, put that at the top part, like the, the, I don't know what you would call it, basically between your scapulas here. I don't know what you would call that in terms of like a, an easy way to describe it to the listeners, but um, you know, where your face finishes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the bottom um, of the neck, top of the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so end I think of my face. <laughs> that's where your heaviest stuff should be, and that what that'll do is it'll stop that kind of swinging of the backpack, and also creates most of the weight in a place where you're stronger. And that that move in particular will stop the downwards pull on your shoulders. So people that suffer with marks on their shoulders here and on their traps is because the bag is not going bumping but pulling down each time yeah. because of the weight. So th this is all the different ways the bags can move, right? So it can go side to side laterally. It can go out and back, which is bumping against your back, but it can also put tug down. So when it's tugging down, that's a shoulder problem, isn't it? So move the distribution of the weight around in your backpack to solve that issue. Uh, if it's moving side to side, address where those things are in the backpack again and look at your fixtures and your strappings. And if it's bumping, that's a tightness issue of like the waist region or, or, you know, wherever it's fitting on your upper back. So that's what you're ultimately after is a, a very basic guide. So it means that you're going to avoid friction and rubbing uh, as much as possible. So, and it, I can see how that seems counterintuitive. I, I, I think when I first started down this line, I thought it would make more sense to have the weight lower. And I was thinking yeah. stability, center of balance, you know, but actually that's not the case. You, you, you are carrying that heavy weight up here on your shoulders, letting them take the work. Hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, it, it's, you're just trying to stop that movement of the bag, which ultimately, and, and, and switch those muscles off so they can, they can work on that. And that avoids friction and rubbing and some people will still get it. And what you can do there is pre-tape or pad. Yeah. So you, if you know that your backpack, whatever you do, you're quite sweaty and there's a lot of salt in your sweat and it creates a bit of friction, you can pre-tape your back. So you can add KT tape to your back in the patches where your, back meet, your bag meets your back. And if your shoulders particularly struggle and you've moved your weight around and it's not solving the issue, then you can add padding to whatever bag there is. So I've seen people add like um, fur, for yes, the, for the ice. Uh, it's not so much an issue on the ice because they're wearing layers. It's more like deserty environments. But you could add tape to your bag. You could add padding that you find, bandages, all that kind of stuff. Or you can tape your shoulders just to stop that uh, as well. So that's a that's a, another a, a way of avoiding that. Uh, but just in terms of just generic comfort, I would always consider moving that um, that that weight around and also making sure that there's no massive gaps in your bag. So the ultimate direction ones I prefer because, and I think you do as well, don't you? Because you yeah. can roll them to size. So anything, it's a really clever feature. So they roll at the top. 
So if you can have it as a, as a full 20 litre bag, but as you start to get into a 10 litre, you can roll the top down until it becomes a, I think about, a, I think when you roll that top down, what would you say about 10, 12 litres? Uh, if you roll that top all the way down, all the way down and down. cinch in the sides as far as it'll go, you can get that down to like a seven, eight litre looking bag. Yeah. So you can get to that by adjusting the bag, but then what you could do if you was carrying four litres but could scale up, let's say you're doing your own adventure and you think, I'm going to carry four litres to here, but I could go up to 20. What you do is you take things like your sleeping bag out of its, obviously you've got a bit of space now, so you take your sleeping bag out. If it's a wet environment, you keep it in your dry bag, but you unravel it and it fills the void of whatever space is there and tucks into the gaps and things like that. It, it creates a fuller backpack again. So you've not got the, and it always happens, doesn't it, on the last day of the race where runners haven't got much left and they've got these little piddly backpacks that are just And swinging. they shake around all and over the place. And they're swinging, yeah. They, it yeah. wasn't a problem day one when it's rammed full, but now they're moving around and all this kind of stuff. So just take your sleeping system or your clothing and, and, and pad it out. Don't do, do the opposite of what you've been doing to get all your stuff in and that's packing everything tight. Um, and, and fill that void with, with stuff and it'll stop all of the kind of movement around and, and uh, issues there as well. Which again seems bonkers, doesn't it? Because at the, at the beginning of the event, it's very much take care and attention, really pay attention to how everything's packed in your bag. And you yep. see people are so insanely careful about getting that sleeping bag down to the smallest possible size. Actually, by the time you get towards the end of the race, what we're saying is, no, open that stuff up again. Make yep. your bag more stable. Stop everything around in there moving around, and you're going to get a lot less of this friction, a lot less bag burn. Yeah, that's it. And I think yeah. that that it, it's counter. You can always understand why people still have their stuff really small at the end, and how people put their heavier stuff at the bottom because that, by and large, makes sense in people's heads. But just think about it in terms of we just want stability as much as we can in this backpack to make sure we can run well. And or move well or walk well or whatever you're doing with this fast packing stuff and, and, and play around accordingly. I think the next issue from that that kind of connects to it is um, actually what literage you take and fitting things in. So how often do we see that everyone gets their kit ready? They've spent a lot of time looking at weight of kit. So they might buy a, you know, a five gram bivy bag that's lighter or they might buy a sleeping bag that, because it's 30 grams lighter. But then when it comes to fitting it into a bag, they think, well, now I need to get a 25 litre bag because I can't fit it into a 20 litre. Um, you know, because that, you know, by the time we add a tracker in there as well, things are tight. Um, yeah. And I think, I think there's, a, there's some obvious things that we can do um, that maybe people haven't thought of and are quite common on races, like things like vac packing your food. You're quite the expert at that, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I love my vac packer. I absolutely do. I'll vac pack anything. Yeah. So what, a very typical thing would be that, let's say, for example, you've got five days of expedition, fire pot, whatever food it is. Um, it takes up quite a lot of space. So the idea is that you filter out those into vac pack bags. You get a vacuum sealer, which is relatively cheap with the, the back racks. Someone, if you're in this world and know mates that have done multi-days, they'll have one. Uh, and you vac pack your food. So it's just like these little vacuum packed bags. And they take up considerably less space. I think you'd probably save about three liters on a five-day, multi-day, just by oh, packing yeah. your food. I'd say that was fair. There's plenty of air in that packaging. There is. And you're getting yeah. rid of all of that. You're getting rid of quite a lot of weight as well. They're much easier to pack in modularly next to each other in the pack because yeah. you end up with these little tubes of food vacuum sealed. It's, it, it's yeah, it's a very, very useful bit of kit. So the only, the only thing to be aware of with that, doing that is that there are, there are an inherent risks that people probably don't talk about as well. So I do it. Um, and what I'll do is I'll take one or two actual meals out that aren't that packed and you use that packaging as your bowl for the week of food. Yeah. So the, the obvious risk with doing that is that your vessel for eating food is probably not thoroughly as washed as you would like it to be and has contained food. Or It would be like the equivalent of you eating a meal at home, putting the plate on the side, and then when you cook your meal the following day, putting your food on whatever plate you've eaten that on, which sounds gross, right? That's essentially what you're doing. And no matter how you try and wash that out with water, unless you're taking little bits of anti-vac and uh, anti-vac and and suds which a lot of people don't you've got you've got that risk of that 
Uh, now, a lot of our races have a, a fair capacity of water, so you can use a lot or you can go down to the river and get most of it off and, and, and add a antibacterial wipe to it. But I know a lot of people don't. And, and, and you're in environments where one person gets ill and, and everyone runs the risk of it. Uh, I think COVID this year has probably highlighted how things can spread and how hygiene is, is so important. This is one of those in-camp etiquettes that if people are doing that, I just recommend that they consider options. John at Five Hot Food shudders when he thinks of it because as well, his food isn't freeze-dried, it's rehydrated. Yeah. So it just the properties of his food add that extra element of risk once they get wet. So it's uh, it's it's one of those things where... I do it. People will continue to do it. And I've, I've done, done it. it. I've been Never on day been five Ill. eating strawberry porridge that actually tastes like the chicken tikka I had three days ago. Yeah. I've done it. But yeah. I think, yes, you're right. It's something to think about. And after this year, I think we're all likely to have a markedly less cavalier attitude to hygiene. Yeah. So exactly. I probably so. wouldn't do that going forward. In fact, my food certainly have a bit more of a thought about what I'm going to eat that food out of afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Whether it's a bottle or whatever, you know, it, it it's just a consideration. I thought I'd mention that just because I, I will probably continue to do that. Um, but just have that extra bit that you, you want to be, you want to be clean that out. Um, so we've gone with like the fit and the kind of load positioning of the bag, um, that, that prevents friction and rubbing. We've gone with like trying your bag out and making sure that you've got a good returns policy to return it, knowing that you might order a couple or whatever, just to make sure that it's definitely the right fit for you. Um, you can load it up at home with stuff and just walk around the house. You'll know pretty quickly if it's going to fit well for you. We've we're, On space saving, we can backpack food. We can look at individual items and make decisions on, you know, how well they pack down. So, for example, our ultralight coat, to mention that again, packs into a pocket. So if you've not got it on, you can pack it into its own pocket and you can shove it down into a, a little area. A lot of waterproofs do that and a lot of light jackets do that. If you're in the Arctic and your coat doesn't fold up easily, might be a consideration um, because, you know, you, you're going to have a lot of gear, more so on our ice race than the others, uh, of stuff that's probably going to be quite voluminous. Um, and then also don't backpack everything prior to coming out because if you backpack medic, medical kits, we are going to ask you to undo that back um, to, to show that you've got the medical items needed. Um, and I think it's just having that knowledge that you've pre-packed it, you've done it before, and you know that you're tight, but by the end of day one, it's no longer going to be an issue. So, yeah, you know, you might be in a squeeze and you might have your food and stuff all around, and it might not be ideal at first, but literally once you eat your first meal, you've got room then. Um, you know, so if you, if you are literally busting to the seams in your bag, that's actually quite a good thing because you know that you've not, you're not pissing around with five litres of bag space that you don't need. If, if your 20 litre bag fits you better and you prefer it. I tell um, you what, it's a, another slight point on the backpacking the food and stuff as well is make sure that you're going to, if you are going somewhere overseas, and I know that seems fanciful to everyone right now, but if you're <laughs> going somewhere overseas, it's worth looking into what kind of packaging they'll allow through. You, if yeah. you backpack all of your food down into plastic and then fly into a country that doesn't allow single-use plastics, you're going to run into a problem. So maybe you want to look at silicon bags you can use instead. Now bear in mind that if you vac seal that stuff and get to the airport and they want to know what it is, then you've got to open it up and you've got no means of packing it again. So just, you know, something to think about depending on where you're going in the world. Yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, you know, some some custom agents can get a bit funny when loads of white powders are vac sealed or through in, uh, in backpacks, you know, so it's quite an, an obscure kit list. But when you've got, you know, energy sachets and all that kind of stuff in clear packaging, um, the first time I flew Tailwind into Peru, I'd yeah. I'd repackaged a load of them into like little packets, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me that that was such a stupid thing to do. I don't know why the but custom agents are bothered about things like cocaine coming into Peru. <laughs> 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 you know, what I, mean? I, I, I really like it baffles me every time we get to Peru because they love me there, don't they? They've nearly they've nearly locked me up a few times. We uh, love customs. Yeah, nothing through anything dodgy, but just because we turn up with all this military grade tracking gear, they bloody love it. Um, but you know, I always highlight to them subtly that, you know, why are you bothered about what I bring into this country? Surely you're more bothered about what comes out of it. It doesn't go down too well is what I find, but, um, <laughs> the, you've just got to also be aware of that because if you get, and the thing is as well, it's like customs can be one thing. Custom agents are another. I feel like I've had my 
fair share of every type of custom agent now. I know them all from the guy that's looking at ripping you off for a couple of hundred dollars and cash that goes in his back pocket to the legitimate one, to the one that's in a bad mood, to the one that's delightful and just lets you through with everything, even though they should have checked, you know, all those kind of things, you know, it depends on the agent. So just be cautious, maybe even take the packaging of that until you clear into country. So at least if there's a language barrier, you can point at the tailwind thing and go, it's this rather than anything dodgy that they have to open up. Yeah. So, um, that's uh that's that i think in terms of clearing space as well i think you want to look at your bag in two ways don't you You want to look at your backpack container which is everything that is your stuff for the adventure and then your front loading ability and what i call by front loading ability that's your snacking for the day your day performance so you don't have to go into the back of your bag or into things like so these are things like your front zips your side pouches and if you're a racer if you're looking at placing well this is where that becomes particularly important because you don't want to be stopping for snacks so um i even opted which i don't see a lot of it. i see a lot of it in the states but not with the other international runners is actually carrying uh so i had um when i did the desert i had to, my water in my front pouch is like normal i don't like big two liter bottles in my face here so this is a, a personal thing for me that if i have a bag high up and i have a one liter bottle in it's here on my chin so yeah. you can't say and especially i don't know how people do it with the straws oh if they have like, those little flexi straws that just tap you in just, the face yeah, as they're you're just running. there and they're like they're blocking your periphery and i don't i, I feel like it needs to you know do it. so i take smaller bottles and and swap them around my bag so i might have a couple of my side pouches here coming up front but i also take a handheld uh bottle. so i've got like a handheld bottle which has a pouch with a zip and a thing in that you can actually put in to your front uh load bottle space but what that does is it just it adds a wrap to that bottle so if you wanted to you can run with the bottle in your hand and in there you can fit in sachets shot blocks snacks and stuff and it just takes the weight off of your backpack and into your hands. And even if there's a couple of pounds that you just have to swap it every now and again, you've got your water there on hand or your juice or your drink, or whatever you're drinking with some snacks. It's constantly there, you know, uh, an easy thing. So if you're a racer, your front load is particularly important. So pay attention to the zips, the little inside pockets and think again, raid light and ultimate direction have built these bags for that. So they've taken a lot of consideration, but, it depends on what you snack on. So, you know, you might want to take your big bag of nuts that you might want to eat as a, and, and divvy them into little sachets that fit these pockets and have a strong system. So you know that that's your, so my setup, for example, my front right pocket here is my slow food. So that's like, I have pork scratchings or nuts, you know, fats that are salty that can go in at the beginning of the day. On my left is my sugary stuff. So if I'm in bother, I go to my left pocket, which is like sugar and jelly beans or Kendall mint cake or whatever. And in my hand are gels or uh, shot blocks or sachets of powder. So they're the ones that I, you know, I time and I know, right, 45 minutes has gone, I have these. And these two are my snacks and food throughout the day. Everything else in the back of my pack, you know, sun cream, if you're racing in a hot environment, needs to be front and center. So that needs to take oh, absolutely. out of space. Um, you might want, if you're chafing really badly, you might want to bring some gurney goo or some vas to the front pocket. So you haven't, haven't got to go into the back. For the ice, you might want to bring gloves into a side pocket here. I think for the ice, that's where your side pockets come in really handy and making sure that you can reach into them. So when you're setting your bag up, consider that you've got your day snack set up and really look at the way that you can do that. And, and you will become comfortable at that when you train with it. Yes. So, you know, spending a lot of time in your bag prior to the event, making sure that the friction things aren't a problem, making sure that, you know, uh, you've had a lot of time experimenting with the setup of your front load and your back load to make sure that it fits right. And then once you've done it for a few times, you'll know you'll, you, I can run with my backpack on and go, no, that's not right. Something's not right. And I just have to stop within the first 10 meters and go, there's movement here or just something doesn't feel right. Um, just cause of time done on it. So I'd say like train with your backpack as much as possible closer to the event, whether you're walking or running or walk running or whatever, like you did a lot of time with your backpack, didn't you? 
Oh, even on days when I wasn't training, my pack was what I was using on my commute. Just, to, just to really have a feel for how I use this pack. Where do I want stuff to be? If it's stuff that I'm going to need regularly, you know, how do I like my water bottles fitted? My body shape is different, so a 600 mil water bottle feels comfortable on the front. And 800 really doesn't because I feel like it's right here under my chin. You you will only find those things out by using that bag a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when it comes to like the stuff that particularly goes in your bag, the kit list itself is really individual. So although, yeah. we're, although we're kind of procuring stuff that we like, um, you know, that our jackets may not be the best for some people. You know, I, I, I consider them to be pretty great products, but you might want a jacket that is, you know, tiny because you can't get it into your backpack otherwise so you buy on that rather than trying to save weight or you know there's different options that you'll go to and if you're if you're doing our ice ultra for example and you're looking at walking at the back of the pack the whole day the ultralight probably may it may not be the best thing if it's minus 40 you know so you you would look at a thicker jacket um that will take up more space and room and you'll probably have more layers in the guys at the front and you'll have more padding. So your backpack and kit setup is going to be wildly different to the guys at the front. So let's give you an example. So we've had the last couple of winners of the ice ultra. We've had what Simon Dix, we had Damien Hall. We've had, yeah. um, uh, oh God, Danish. Oh, I've uh, lost it. Simon, Simon Grimstrup, yeah. Simon Grimstrup, Simon Grimstrup. Um, I can't even think who won before that. Uh, Vicente. Vicente, yeah. So we've had we've had some great winners. And if you say to them, oh, cool, you know, these guys have won a race, what should I... They'll have a lot of good... I, I guarantee their bag will fit well. It'll be well set up for them with food. They'll have the front loading and snacks all sorted out. And they'll have some great space-saving and weight-saving tips. However, just be mindful that they're racing and not out as long as most people. So yeah. you're probably going they're to packing for pocket. six, seven hours in the snow, not 16, 17 hours in the snow. And it's very different. And like even their calorie requirements will be different because their foods, you know, they'll require less food and stuff where you will require more food. And that's the benefit of training. Well, is the fact that you can actually bring your weight of your pack down because your requirements are less. So, um, I think just be mindful of any, there's some things we're saying like the movement of the bag shouldn't happen, but just be mar- I, I'm not going to tell you exactly what you should pack or what food to use because that's completely individual but just apply those principles to your backpack and you will be well on your way. Um, I think in terms of like the distribution load we've covered, we've covered train with your pack. Um, and also maybe mention with training with your pack, you don't have to go to full weight, like integrate that up slowly. So just like you, like you do with your miles, you wouldn't just start with a hundred mile run, you know, a hundred mile week, you would integrate that. So do that with your weight. And if you're losing body weight, it's quite a good thing to do on your longer run. So let's say if hypothetically you are 82 kilo when you start your training for a multi-day and once a week you go out for a long run and you're now 81 kilo on your longer runs, weigh your backpack. You might only need one kilo, a few snacks, food, water, because you're going out for an hour and a half. But as you get closer to the event, your 82 kilo might have gone to 78 kilo. So make sure your backpack weighs four kilo. And really, you're just training at the same weight the whole time. Just the weight distribution has changed. It's come off of your body and gone onto your back. It's the only difference. But it's not going to be a strange feeling because I've also done it that way where I went from 80 kilo to 72 kilo training for a marathon, quick training, without any backpack. And then I put a six kilo backpack on and it felt horrendous where if I'd like to think that if at least once a week or every other week I was putting two, three, four kilo in a bag and running for longer, uh, it would just soften that blow on how that feels. Um, Because it'd be quite a difference when you're doing lots of fast mileage to put a backpack on and hit a hill. You soon know about it, don't you? So I'd say just integrate integrate your weight on slowly and you shouldn't really be doing a full six to 10 kilo backpack until really close to the event. So you don't need to, to do that well out. Um, I think that in terms of like the way that we look at that it's space saving as well, there's the obvious like cutting toothbrushes. There's, uh, I was about to say, how have we got this far into a backpacking, <laughs> yeah, a backpacking yeah, talk without talking about cutting your toothbrush up? I think a lot of people know that. So cut your toothbrush, don't take all the toothpaste you need, don't take all the Vaseline you need, don't take the full tub, take, you know, what you'll need for five days. 
skinny your thing out. And I suppose the thing there is have a spreadsheet. I know people, some people like even myself, when it's like a spreadsheet is mentioned, you run for the hills. But it is actually worthwhile having a little Excel spreadsheet or writing down on a bit of paper, however you want to do it, of every item that's going in your bag and the weight of it. Yep. So you can total it up and you can then make choices if you feel like you want to reinvest in new kit. So if your medical kit is a kilo, which is a bloody heavy medical kit, um, there's so much, some items in that that you don't need. You know, or there's you might have a 500 gram coat that you see on sale at Sport Pursuit or something like that, a 200 gram coat that's the same specs. Oh, I'll get that because it says me 300 gram and I've got a bit of money and all that kind of jazz. Or if money's tight, you know that your quota for your weight is filling up. So you know, you know, oh, I should probably go lighter here. I've got some room to go heavier here for some more layers on the ice and all that kind of jazz. So have that spreadsheet. And then when it, you compare with friends and stuff that are also doing the event, it's quite handy because you can see where the, where your weight is coming from and where you can strip it out. So I'd agree with that. I, I think I got to the point before the ice ultra where I was so insane with weight, with weighing every single item and getting it on my spreadsheet and making sure it was pared down that actually when it got to the event, I'd been training with more than I actually had on my back. I was I was more prepared. If anything, what I found was just before the event, I I let myself succumb to temptation a little bit and add a couple of extras that I hadn't I hadn't even considered. Yeah. Um. I I found it put me in that direction. Whereas I think if you're just doing it by feel, if you're not actually adding it up and really closely monitoring what's in there, it can very quickly get out of hand and you end up with a very heavy pack. Yeah, and you and come that's, unstuck. That's going to ruin your first couple of days. You come unstuck when you don't treat it with any sort of priority and you pack your bag late. And I hate and then, spreadsheets, Chris, and you hate numbers. And we're saying this. We're yeah, saying that you should weigh while. them and do the maths. It really is going to be worth the maths. Yeah, it's worthwhile. And I, th- I think um, you can always send that out to someone else. There's plenty. Honestly, if you put a spreadsheet of your backpack on a, one of our Facebook groups, and guarantee there's going to be some really excited people in there because it's one of their favorite things to do. And if you're not that type of person, you think, oh, you know what, I'll just bundle a bag together. That's fine. You can also do that. But, you, you know, take these considerations. And I think the longer your journey, I mean, like, bear in mind, I've done, I've done stuff which has been a month out of a backpack. All right. So I, I, with Kimball on the GBA, it was a month living out of a backpack. All right. So me and, me and that bag have become one, really. You know, one biologically speaking, I think yeah, literally by yeah. the end of that thing, um, it was it was my shell. Um, prior to that event, I'd spent insane amounts of time looking at kit because of the problem is it's like how am I going to get everything in from? Yes, we topped up with food and we had points that every five days that we could top up again, but the bag was constantly on its way down or then fully loaded, and then me and Kimball had to work out who was carrying the tent, who was carrying this, who was carrying that, who was carrying this. And there was this constant kind of like movement. I was trying to progressively load him heavier every single time. Yeah, well, obviously, it's the only way to slow him down. Just to even things out. So I was even putting rocks in his bag at one point. Um, But the the thing that um, you want to do is just spend that time on just bringing it out. Because what you'll find as well is most of your weight is food. So your question then of like, right, what, what food do I need? And what food, you know, do I go a little lighter here or heavier here or, you know, that kind of stuff. So, and then it's what you're comfortable with. It's what you're comfortable with. But I'd say that, you know, if you're under six, you could probably like, you're either experienced. If you're under six kilo, you're really experienced or you're too low on your food. Um, If you're between six and eight, you've done a very good job. If you're between eight and 10, you've done a good job or you're planning to be towards the back. If you're over 10, there's definite things that you could probably do to bring your pack weight down. And we've seen it. We've seen it. Whatever you think people would have put in that backpack that, that doesn't make a lot of sense, we've seen it. I My favorite one was the person that brought the weighing scales in their backpack so that they could tell that they had a light bag. Yeah, that was genius. So they didn't include yeah, the weight of the so weighing they, scales in so there. So they thought they thought like day three, just to check their bag was like they could weigh their bag on day three. And go, oh, okay, yeah, it's like six kilo. I'm good. Like, well, why don't you just leave the scales out, knowing that your bag's going to get lighter? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, what was a good one? The um the full large glass jar of peanut butter. That was a favorite of mine. And although, as I remembered, they also had a jar of honey. 
and we ended up squeezing the contents of both into a bag that they just kind of squeezed into their mouth over the course of the event. Yeah, that worked same out quite person, well. That same person also had a salt and pepper grinder. <laughs> <laughs> not even a, not even the the argument I had was like there are salt and pepper grinders that are joint now. At least do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> at, like, at least get one that mixes the two. Yeah, surely I, I wouldn't. Yeah, you know, I half expected him to pull out this massive Italian restaurant style pepper grinder. But then he all um, the other thing. Uh, so there was the peanut jar of peanut butter. The best one, I think, uh, is on our for Rangers race. We had a lady bring a full avocado. Well, you got to have a treat, haven't you? Two. I think there was actually two or three of them, just full avocados like that. And I just thought, how have how are they like? I don't know if this is a thing like I, she was from the U S bless her. So she must've brought that avocado in Kenya and it may, but like avocados here in the UK, they're not ready to eat. And then there's a 30 second window when they're ready to eat and then they're black. So how she managed, to, <laughs> she managed to keep this avocado in shape and in a, a decent fettle enough to eat is beyond me. But that was it. Maybe that was her handheld. She was just carrying the avocado <laughs> as she ran across Kenya so that she was ready at the exact moment that it was edible. Yeah, exactly. Just watching it. But then um, I think as well, uh, a lot of the experienced guys would say is um, weight is everything, of course, but also have some luxury items because they can change the game. So for me, a couple of bits of uh, dilute squash. You drink a lot of water, so you can get these little bottles that are you know no bigger than 10, 20 centimeters big, which is concentrated um cordial that you can add into water if you're struggling to get water down especially in hot races is a really good tip um and even in the evenings we me and uh cy davis created hot squash club so it's amazing how good hot squash is in an evening you know hot cordial nice warm cup of uh you know black currant cordial this is a nice little comforting thing uh, i know carolyn who's a veteran of ours takes fresh socks every day for the jungle absolute pointless exercise in terms of you know they're going to get wet in the first minute she recognizes that but she just likes the feeling of putting on fresh socks at the end of each stage or you know the morning of each stage to have her feet have talc and all that kind of jazz so she brings a fresh pair of socks for each day for the jungle um a few sachets of hot chocolate absolutely yeah. i never drink hot chocolate never you never know? in never in my normal everyday life but i'm lost if i haven't got a few of them in my packs just to just to have in the evening when i'm settled all my admin's done and i know i'm just in my rest time now Little makes picnic, my day yeah. yeah so i take um my my other luxury item is not taking a lightweight foldable cup i take an actual cup because uh, i don't like the rubbery you can have a really nice coffee and it's ruined by the foldable rubbery cup taste of you know whatever they make that out of so i have uh, which is another reason why we've got the kapilka cups on the store because they're hardy indestructible little cups that you can have a nice nice cup of coffee in in the morning rather than some little sandy petri filled dish of rubber that you've done to save some weight so there's <laughs> um, there's so many nooks and crannies in those fold down cups and saucers and <laughs> yeah, stuff yeah. as well like i am still finding bits of the namib desert in in mine I now. Opened a and they've been through my dishwasher the, the last time i used one of them is when we was on day four of the jungle and i opened up my foldable cup and a moth flew out of it <laughs> and i was like nope done that's gone. Yeah, the moth flew away with it. But I don't believe that in <laughs> yeah, the jungle. I don't believe big. that. Yeah, they're that big. I just literally fold up a cup, went in the bin, done. No way, not having it. So uh, yeah, have some luxury items in your backpack as well. And you know what? It also gets a bit like prison rules on these things, doesn't it? Where when your palate fatigue kicks in on day three or four, and you know you've brought all that peanut butter sachet, or you've brought that you know sugary snack that you can't physically stomach. A bit of prison rules goes on around camp where it's like, well, I'll swap you my 10 jelly beans for, for that. If someone's got an upset, uh, upset stomach, toilet paper becomes a new currency. You know, it's all those kind of things where have a few little luxury items in that you know, you know are going to be worth their weight in gold come day three. Absolutely. If you are the person sitting on a full bar of Kendall mint cake on day four, you can buy anything with that. Yeah. Anything. And I think, I think um, you know, for me, it's, it's a bit of an insider's tip this, but I go to these events knowing that people are going to get palate fatigue and that they're probably not going to eat everything that they bring. 
So I will like just keep my ear to the ground. And if someone's got a meal that they don't want, I'll swap a full 800. They might have an 800 calorie meal and I'll sneak. Yeah. I'll say, Oh, well, what do you want for this? Well, I've got these 400 calorie noodles. There you go. I've just gained an extra 400 calories and had a decent meal for some noodles. These dry pack noodles that we spoke about in, in previous episodes, uh, these, these things that are high in calories, they're really light and they're super palatable. You can get them down even, even, People that don't eat a lot can get these down in, in tough environments. So uh, have those little luxury items. Adam Kimball tells a great story about how he did a race, multi-stage race, and some guy, it was like day four, they'd done a long stage and had a rest day the day after. Um, and lo and behold, in the middle of this desert on day four, he just brought out a can of Coke. And while everyone was sat around, just went Psst, and opened it. And everyone was like, where'd you get that from? I just brought it. It's my, my luxury item. And everyone was just like, oh, my days. Imagine <laughs> what he could have got for that, though. You know what I mean? Like, it's prison rules now. Like, who's going to give me <laughs> all of their food for this can of Coke? <laughs> uh, by, that, by that stage in a multi-stage race, the crew were probably desperate enough for that can of Coke that he could have traded it for his medal. <laughs> I, I'm saying it's worth that much at that point. So I think... Um, I think, you know, have that luxury item as well as a little add-on bonus. Um, and, 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 you know, that's individual to each person, as is the front load, as is the bottles. You know, even another particular thing I have is I, I have to make sure that whatever water bottles I use, they don't slush around. So it, I can't really have hard bottles in my bag. The thermo bottles, you've got really no other option on to use them but the ice. But if they're, in, if they're front-loaded and they're going... Whoosh, whoosh, just like the the Shelly kind of jackets, I can't have them because it's all I'll hear for the next three to six hours. So I have to have soft flask bottles that I squeeze the air out of to make sure that they don't slush around. So um, other tips Again, like that. try your stuff out in training. Yeah. You don't want to be finding that out when you are in the middle of the Namib desert and you're still 30 kilometers away from getting to the end of that day. That I, is, is <laughs> not where you want to find out that kind of stuff is going to drive you literally insane. It do, if it doesn't bother you, this is a good point. If it doesn't bother you, be considerate of the people that are around you because I <laughs> still have nightmares about Emma and Victoria in the desert with the cup on the carabiners. So me and Simon Davies talk about this all the time of, you know, Simon Davies, he finished the race last year. Unfortunately, the year before he, he didn't make it and credit to him. He stayed and supported everyone on the race and became part of the crew rather than going home. And then on the last day, he volunteered to walk in two of our runners for 13 miles, walked with them to, to finish them on the long stage of the desert ultra, which is a, an absolute route. And I said, well, you know what? These are the last two. Everyone else is in. I'll do this 13 mile walk with you. So there was me, Sam, and these two, two girls, Emma and Victoria, who were absolutely exhausted at the end of their tether. But on the back of their backpack, they had a metal cup attached to a carabiner. And with every single step, you would hear. It took six to eight hours, that last 13 miles. Conversation was pretty dry after the first hour. We played all ah. the trail games. So there was multiple times. It was the middle of the night and then the mid desert. It was beautiful stars. You know, it's nice and cool by this point. And me and Simon Davies are looking at each other for five hours, six hours. That's it. I know that stretch of trail you're talking about as well. Usually walking down there, you should be like, oh my God, look at the stars. Or wow, there's actually lion tracks here, you know, but no, 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 no. I Just... actually got to the end and I wanted to club both of them to death. Um, oh, you can't do that. Well, they'd finished by that point. So I, I could then, you know, say, but if we had a little team for them that, that we called them cup wankers and, you know, they said that they would do it for every, every race moving forward. So be considerate of the runners around you. Make sure that you're not a clanger or a, or a yeah, don't bring a cowbell. No, unless you don't want anyone around you for the race. That's also a good thing. Um, but yeah, you know, imagine, imagine that in your situation that you was on a frozen lake for six hours, just hearing that noise, you'd, you would spiral into a, a pit of despair quite quickly. I imagine. Oh, yeah. Drill a hole in the ice, get under there. That's, that's the only way forward. <laughs> and that's it then for now, really. I mean, the backpack stuff, you can always put it to the group. You know, I, there's a lot of experience and stuff like that. But use those principles. And any fast packing adventure you go on, uh, you'll be well set. 
Yeah, and if you're looking for specifics, we we do have a couple of videos about this as well. Yeah. Head for the Beyond the Ultimate YouTube channel and you'll find some actual runners picking apart their specific kit. If you want to see, because we haven't gone into, you know, this item's better than this, this brand of equipment's better than this one. We're not going to. Mm. But if you want to see somebody pick apart their kit to that level, we got that as well. Yeah, and they're pretty dated now, so we'll probably re-record them soon. But it's you know, oh, yeah. ways to save weight on your glow sticks. All that kind of you'll pick up something that you'll go oh yeah you can think about that um but we'll re-record a couple of those i think uh over the next year when we have a bit of time because we could do with refreshing those uh with some with some examples of weight saving stuff and, and weigh it out there then um that's it really it's yeah. probably worth mentioning I, I think actually we covered everything that we we're over the hour mark mate and okay. we we're just talking about backpacks cool well i think it's probably worth mentioning as well we've not really done it on the other coaching episodes that if you are liking these, don't forget to leave us a review on whatever you're listening to. It makes a massive difference to, you know, the where this podcast gets pushed to. And our listening has near enough tripled, hasn't it, over the last couple of months? It's more, yeah, more it's than got, tripled since since enough. the start of the year. We we just about quadrupled. Yeah, so we we've we really really you know really really appreciative of you guys tuning in and listening in. And you know, obviously, you've you've had a lot of time with Will. Uh, and some great athletes, but please leave us a review. It's not for our ego or anything like that. It's just because by you leaving us a review and the star rating and stuff, these sites that we host our podcasts on rank us higher and higher. And the more listeners we get, not only can we get better guests, but actually the production of each episode will increase as well. So one of the things we're looking at doing for next year, we could probably talk about this now. For you regular listeners, you'll notice that we've gone down to two a month. What will happen as of next year is we will do these occasional episodes where we're together. Um, but what will also happen is that Will will have episodes on his own with people that are breaking records and great athletes in the endurance world. And I will have my episodes with coaches, physios, you name it. And they will be more, you know, with practical advice. So whatever side you like listening to on this podcast, whether it be the coaching or whatever, either one of us is going to cover that angle. Um, but what we want to do for the coaching side, at least is invite people into the studio. So get people into the room and they'll almost turn like webinars. So we'll screen share. We can go through gate analysis. We got, it'll be really, really good and great content. And we're going to, we at BTU are going to invest money into this to do it. Um, but obviously the, the help that you can give us by just very simply leaving a review, you know, there's, we know that when we launch this episode that there's a good thousand people that download this as it comes in right? yep. and then it gets topped up, you know, throughout the coming weeks and stuff like that. So there's a thousand of you that listen in regularly yet. We've only got 36 reviews on iTunes. So that tells me that. I mean, a, don't have a go at them. No, but, but it, it tells me there's a thousand of you. <laughs> but if you could leave us a review, yeah, there's that'd a thousand be great. of you that really like the content and stuff. Just please, please, please just, just help us out. And I know we don't ask for this too often, but just so we can we can maximize the kind of content that we get to you because we'd like to pay the guests to come down to the studio and record with us. We'd like to get some new cameras to record this and screen share. And you guys, you know, we'll reinvest that back in you if you can just help us out a little bit there as well. So unusually on this episode, I've done a bit of begging and selling. Uh, I will go back to my usual ways of not being a shit house from from this point. But uh, thank you guys as well for listening in and. Uh, giving us all your great feedback so far and contacting and reaching out and we will i don't know what's going to be in two weeks actually i've got no no idea have you got any ideas yeah yeah there's a there's a couple lined up i haven't decided which one it's going to be next but yeah okay cool so yeah there's going to be some great i'm not going to tell them now oh, okay a bit more secretive <laughs> um but yeah that, so our next episode will be in two weeks time um check out the store check out uh the review sites and leave us your reviews and uh did you just wrap up the podcast? Yeah. I've, I've been doing that. You can't just swan in. Take on. it off me. Go on then. You do it. No, 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 no